Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from beautiful Vieques, Puerto Rico, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Friday. Fridays are, it's not a special day, but it's a special day because we're studying the Bhagavatam. And Kastuba, I tell you, I'm not very impressed with the material world. Yeah. But I was very, I had a very impressive night last night. My You're wife not impressed to, with the material world. I'm not impressed with the material world. You so just much. look at it and say, I'm "Not impressed." This place is well. I, you know, I, you, I've, I've been I feel sensing like, a, a type of uh, lack of full vacation thrill in you. Well, that's my. Well, here's the deal. I feel like the Bhagavatam cuts through the romance of the material world. There's beautiful things. There's wonderful things. But it's still the material world. And our, I find a real joy is from our, our service, our regulation, our diet, our stuff like that. So I'm sort of like off my off my regular plan. And it's good to be with the family and the kids. And I enjoy it. And it's beautiful. But sort of I'm like a little off my regulation. So my wife really, one thing she wanted to do was go to a bioluminescent bay. Have you ever heard of that? I've heard of it, yeah. Mara went, but she had a, she, I think she had a bioluminescent um, fail. Was <laughs> the, the 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 bacteria didn't show up or something? Or? Well, what there happens a, is you gotta yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Mary. it was a it was a full moon when I went. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, so it it's just... like it's there's like practically no moon now, and so my wife picked this day where we go on this particular night, and it was the perfect conditions. Every and it, you know I usually want you to bed describe what it is because a lot of well it's a type it. of bacteria that glows. Yeah. Um, and if I actually read the uh, wikipedia thing i which i which i did pull up it, it, it almost got to it almost got depressing because it says the wide range purpose for biological the wide range biological purpose of bioluminescence include but are not limited to attraction to mates and defense against predators so hold that thought first i'm going to get okay. into the in, into the material um experience oh you're muted you muted yourself brother. Hold it, hold it. <laughs> Is he going to pick up that he's muted? <laughs> wow. yeah, you're talking, muted. I'm talking to nobody, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We get in this canoe, and the canoe is see-through. It's a okay. see-through canoe. It's like a morning. Um, and uh, as soon as you go in the water, it's a calm bay. and It's like a big circle of a bay. And it's not deep. It's like 14 feet deep. Okay. And as soon as you put your paddle in the ground, in the water rather, just it's almost like electrical sparks are coming off your paddle. And it's pitch black. And you can see and under your canoe, it, it looks like you're on Star Trek flying through space. There's just millions of like star-like tiny dust, star sparkle dust. And then all of a sudden, the, the the bacteria cling on to anything in the water. Like you put your hand in there, your hand will start to glow. Right. If you put your paddle in there, your paddle starts to glow. If you put a if you put a fish in there, you can start to see fish. 
Did you dive I mean, in? I, and I like... saw shark. You know, you're not allowed to dive in because they're trying to preserve it. But um, no they way. Got, like, There's so many guards or something, or it's just kind of like they trust. No, you it's like know? a massive open bay. Mm-hmm. Known people just don't do it. But I saw a shark. I saw a shark. I saw a shark. A bioluminescent <laughs> shark. It was like it was like it was, it was like a five foot shark. Did you freak out? I just went a shark. <laughs> <laughs> and it was glowing. Everything in there is glowing. It's unbelievable. And you, and you have to have good conditions. And it was still, it was super dark. But then when I read that thing in Wikipedia about the basis for it is just sort of like why why they're glowing. It's for eating. Or no, it's for uh, mating and defense. So, you know, in the Bhagavatam, it has this whole thing about, this is one of those first things you learn getting into bhakti. And maybe I don't, maybe we don't talk about it that much, or maybe you heard it in a purport, but the living being in the material world is doing nothing more than eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. And I'm thinking that's the bioluminescence, as beautiful as they are. They're mating and defending. And I'm sure eating and sleeping are in there somewhere too. <laughs> but, and they only live a few days. But this is our condition in the material world. We're, we're really just eating and we're, 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 just, we're mating, eating, sleeping, mating and defending. And so the masters, the acharyas, they say, if this is all we're doing with our life, we're no better than animals. If, if, if we think we are these great, if we think, oh, we are these great beings, we are at the, uh, um, uh, we are at the climax of, uh, of, uh, of evolution. If all we are doing is eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, Rogu, come on back. What we are doing is fooling ourselves. We're no better than animals. We're no better than bacteria. Okay, there you go. Yeah, well, they're, they're called, Prabhupada calls them the animal propensities, right? Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, and so he would. He would do have a special. And he, our he, special intelligence is to dive deeper into our spiritual life. That's what separates us from the animals. Right. Otherwise, we go. Sometimes humans go. Not sometimes. A lot of times, we're much worse than animals. We do real horrible things. I mean, animals can do some horrible things too. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves. Okay, go on. What are we saying? No, I was just kind of like you were you were cutting out, so I was just trying to sew the ends oh, of your wow. thing together. It worked. It, it kind of worked. It, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but your, but your just pa- to, your patches just, patch me up. Just to make it, make it more clear, yeah. So Prabhupada would call these the the animal propensities: eating, sleeping, mating, defending. And so the point again is that if we look at our life and we say that this is really all I'm involved in, like f- from morning till night, you know, it's like in one sense, you know, my occupation has to do with my mating you know i need money so i can wear the right clothes and get the right car and you know i need the right home that's part of defending and you know you know defending my territory you know whatever that may be may play out in my occupation and then mating of course and eating and sleeping if this is what comprises my whole life and just trying to do that better right i want to eat better i want to mate better (laughs) you know i want to be better defending well it's a mating itself that's so consuming because mating is not just the act of mating. It is sort of like, too. it's why we go to the gym. Yeah. I mean, if if there was no mating involved, would people even, a lot of people, wouldn't, there would be no sort of self-care working out. It's all, a lot of our like um, taking care of ourselves has to do with how others think of me. Isn't that horrible? It's like, I want other people to like me, so I'm going to work out. It's not working out because my body is a gift and I want to take care of it. Mm-hmm. It's working out because I want to attract a mate. So that comes into play. Then there's, of course, there's fashion. You got to keep up with fashion. You got to wear, wear something that looks good. Does this look good on me? My haircut, does this look good on me? Whatever else we do to our face, does that, how's my face looking? Are these shoes good on me? And it almost becomes got nothing to do with me anymore, but how I project myself. So that mating thing, is a super comp it's almost like why we wake up in the morning sometimes unless we have a bigger you know unless we see ourselves as part of a bigger contribution to the whole and of course there's you know there's you know mara is our our uh our chef and you know there's eating eating can get very complicated some people even call themselves foodies 
<laughs> I'm a matey. What are you? I'm a foodie. <laughs> what are you? I'm a, we got the martial defendi. arts guys. I'm a defendi. <laughs> I'm a sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a s- <laughs> So that, that that's like a it becomes a thing, and then we become like fine connoisseurs of food or of sleep or of defense, and um, basically we are just like these very very complicated, sophisticated animals. Mm-hmm. If that's all we're doing, right. well, it sounds and to me whole, like and, like Bhagavatam and, is is ruining your enjoyment of through, the world. <laughs> It, it, you know, the Bhagavatam, and, and people will realize this if they're new to it, as you get into your spiritual life, your material life will be ruined. And I, I say ruined because you'll just sort of see it for what it is. And it, it, the rom- the shininess of it, the romance of it will sort but, of go away. But but as that sun on material enjoyment starts to gradually set, you know, the sun of spiritual you know, enjoyment or spiritual happiness is rising, you know, simultaneously, right? Like as one's well, going down, the other's coming up. No, just uh, the whole thing becomes depressing. Really? Everything yeah. becomes depressing. <laughs> okay. no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, what happens is you, uh, um, you, you start to see the material world for what it is. And you, and then as you click in with your spiritual happiness, then you need less from the material world to make you happy. Hmm. You need less you demand less from the material world to make you happy. You learn to be happy with very simple things in life. That's a beautiful thing. I mean, that was the the gift of monkhood when we are monks is learn to be happy with absolutely nothing in, in, in very, very simple conditions. I mean, if you think about the way we lived as monks, you could call that sort of like abusive. Oh, yeah, we slept on the floor. We were crammed together. We traveled in a van, packed in a cargo van illegally and you know we sat on the floor and we ate our food and we ate you know we ate with no utensils we ate with our hands i mean you could you could make a case against like they abused us in the People ashram did. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget so those it was Ted patrick what, videos yeah well and the and the thing is it, it was um absolutely and what to speak of if you're in india where it's like and the weather was tough and there was no ac and i had no hot water for six years and whatever there's a in one sense it was it was against what the senses really wanted and we were forced to find a deep happiness you know truthfully i think you know a lot of times we suffer in this world from too much too many choices we have too many choices and um uh, and we are living in our mind. And we're living always in our almost like a spoiled child. We have so much, and we're finding new things to complain about to make us miserable. What do you think? Yeah, I, one thing that interests me is is um, you, when you read Bhagavad Gita and then Bhagavatam, you you get this. Particularly, I see this like in the universal form, which is in the eleventh eleventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna reveals to Arjuna this universal form. It's kind of like everything in one vision, you know, mm. like the universe all in one vision. But it's kind of like everything that's beautiful is there, but everything that's well, horrible is there. It, and, it's, and it's unbearable for Arjuna to see, you know. Mm. And um, kind of like with the, 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 the Gyana Chakshusa that you're wearing, your, 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 your goggles of knowledge. Truth you know? goggles. Your truth goggles, yeah. You're, so you're out there, and when you look at that, I, I'm sure you enjoyed it. It was probably far out, and it was fun, and it was beautiful. And there's no, something... it was a highlight of material existence. It was, it was for, for me. It was like a, a very memorable moment. It was magical. It was, it was, ma- it was Great. otherworldly. Yeah, and at the same but even time, even even after an hour and a half of it, I was sort of like, okay, can we go back <laughs> to the shore. I got the magic. But... Yes. But I was going to say that you can see the beauty in it, but you can also see, like when you have those eyes, you're also seeing what's ugly behind it too. It's not necessarily that it's ruining your day or that it's, you know, um, uh, scaring you or something like that. But you can see, you know, like even here, even in the most beautiful far out manifestation, you can see it's still the same eating, sleeping, mating, defending going on. That's always going on underneath this. And everything that's beautiful in this world, it's got another lining too that's, you know, like horrible. You know, you see the beautiful forest, you go into it and you get real close up and you see there's all kind of horrors going on in there. 
you know. Well, the forest is the forest is horrible. Don't kid yourself. Yeah. Everything's trying to kill everything. Yeah. <laughs> so and Mirror's like, what are they talking about today? <laughs> that's the, that's the nature of this world. It's beautiful. I'm serious. And it's you hear these. You hear the birds chirping right now. It sounds very beautiful. They're chirping for, where's my mate? Yeah, where's you know? my food? Where's, where's my mate? Or who's it? Can I tell you a horrible story? My, and I, I heard this late, like later in life. My, my older sister, when she was little, she had a, a beautiful parakeet that she loved. And my father was like, you know, he's a New York Italian guy from the, tw- from the, tw- from the, you know, the depression era. He, he hated pets. My dad was not into pets. And so he was like, you know what? I'm going to let this pet go. So he somehow convinced my daughter to let my sister to let the bird go. And so here's a beautiful bird. He gives it the freedom and lets the bird die. And um, a hawk comes by and immediately kills that bird. That quick? that, That quick. Like immediately, like he witnessed, he let it go. And another bird came to kill it. My point is, my point is here, it's a cruel, it's a cruel world. You don't just have to worry, you know, even for beautiful birds, hawks come out of nowhere and try to kill you. That is part of the, we're really starting this morning in a real cheery way, aren't we? Okay, I thought let's I was gonna, shift gears. Let's shift gears. Okay. Yeah. I thought I was going to make you all happy with the bioluminescent story, but no, it was turned cool. out to be yeah. one of my depressing stories again. No, no it was cool, it was cool. Ready? Why don't you chant, chant those mantras and so we'll get going? Sure. Narayanam namaskritya naram chayva narotamam devim sarasvatim vyasam tatojayam mudiraye. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord Narayan, and to Narayan Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, and to Mother, Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta Prayeshva Bhadreshu Nicham Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtaki. By regular attendance in classes in the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart will become vanquished and loving service to the transcendent Lord, whose praise with transcendental songs will be established as an irrevocable fact. Om Gyanat Murandasya Gyanan Janasalakya Chakshurun Militam Gyena Tazmai Sri Gurave Namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance, and my gurus, my teachers, have opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. Now, for my respectful obeisances to them. All right. We're good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Want me to start? Oh, this, yeah, you don't have a box. I don't have a, <laughs> okay, I don't have a right. book. I'm just walking around with an iPhone in the streets of Puerto Rico, cool. looking like a madman. All right. So, we are at a place right now. Where um, there's a, we're going to go through a section of verses right now. They're a little bit well. They're technical, right? And it's the the process of creation in finer detail is going to be described by Maitreya to the sage Vidura. And these verses, like when you read them, you know this is the kind of stuff that like bhakti yoga scientists will really be able to take verses like this and speak for hours and hours. You know, and show you like just see right here what it's what it's what it's saying, and and how this is now playing out in quantum mechanics and quantum physics, and you know like they can tie all these things together. It's there's there's a lot of depth in here that a novice won't fully uh, get, or you know, a lay person won't fully get. Um, and, and but I can draw. I feel I can draw something essential out of it, and um, so I'll, I'll try to translate that as we read it. Okay with me yeah, great gotcha. and, and and so in the bhagavad gita and in, in bhagavatam in upanishads you know it talks about the mahabhuta so the the um the five Prabhupada would call them the gross material elements earth water fire air and ether and then there are the subtle material elements which are manas which is like the impulsive mind uh ahankara which is the false ego and mm. buddhi which is the intelligence and so you add up all of those eight elements and that's what the material world is made out of that's one way to categorize it and break it down fundamentally and so here we're going to read about how ego we've been reading these verses about like how we've been using this analogy of like a dough right and and the ingredients of the material world are kind of um kneaded together in a dough and then lord vishnu glances in that dough and impregnates it with the with all of us with the, the living beings 
and then the heat of time kind of starts to make that dough start to transform or rise, you could say. And so what we're hearing about now is as that dough is rising in the oven, the transformations that are taking place and what's starting to manifest as, as creation is developing. All right. Okay. And so the creations that are, what's going to be described here is how the element of false ego that within this universe, there's an element that, that, um, influences the Atma to identify with the body and the mind that that's going to yeah. manifest. Okay. And it, and then it's going to show how one after another, the different Mahabhutas manifest. First, um, ether, and then with ether, there's there's a um, corresponding sense, you know, a sense object, and that's sound. And then from then after ether comes air, and air carries not only the sound but also the experience of touch. And then after that comes fire. And fire has sound, the, the experience of touch, as well as sight. And so they go, they go you know, on like this, you know, then, then uh, what is it? Then comes uh, earth, water, fire, air, Mind, a water, then comes water. And from water, you have all the, the previous ones plus taste. And then finally earth, and earth has all of them plus smell, right? And so these develop one after another. And, and so what's happening is, that um, the 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 senses, as well as the objects of the senses, are are manifesting in the universe now. There, there, you know, the, the dough is rising, and and this is what's being produced. The senses, the sense objects, and then also what's produced next is the devas, the 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 gods of the different of the god of the fire, the god of of water, god of of air, god of you know sound, and all that. They're all produced as well. And so what's really, if we, if we want to try to look at this in a practical way or use a, an analogy that we use all the time, is like a virtual reality. If, if I wanted to put Raghunath into a virtual reality, I would have to create how he's going to experience sound in that virtual reality. So there'd have to be some kind of speakers that would have to produce sound. And so that, that, that's like producing the ether. But I would also have to produce a microphone for Raghunath through which he would pick up sound, right? And so that's, you know, that's like the ears or, you know, the, and so all the senses and the sense objects are created so that we get our little suits that we get with that we call bodies that we can move through this world in and experience it, you know, try our to avatar. Yeah, our avatar, our little, yeah. That, that becomes our avatar. Like you, one day on the show, you called it like a fake God suit, right? And so when we call it avatar, it's actually super appropriate. Right? I like that, a fake God suit. Did I say that? You said that, yeah. I think you Genius. Said that you are. <laughs> and, and, but, uh, you know, I was thinking of like when we were kids, there was no, um, you know, the virtual reality was Pong. Do you yeah. remember Pong? You know, you're the virtual is quite simple. You're playing a stick and you're basically playing ping pong with a stick and there's no colors and the sound was minimal. And the only different options in the game was faster, slower, smaller paddles, bigger paddles. <laughs> but um, and as, nowadays it's like I'm not really a, video, a gamer, but it's so realistic. You, you can live in it. And so what the Vedas is, is it's it's explaining that the whole material cosmos with sense imagine if you're adding sense and the, like you can get wet imagine if you're playing a video yeah. game you can get wet i'm going through the touch. swamp and i'm soaking yeah. touch and uh, I'm, I'm sure where this is where the virtual reality is going but basically we're in that already yeah we're in that already well, where we you, com completely get sucked up in just like you get sucked up in a movie and you fall in love and you the, the, the lover breaks the heart and you cry or the or the hero dies and you're crying in the movie or you're feeling great joy and romance and connection in the movie. And it's, con it's all concocted in the mind. It's a movie. And this is what's going on in the material world. It's hard. It's so, it's so ups it's partly upsetting to say it's like, Oh, wait a second. This whole thing's a movie. Yeah. Go I on. was going to say that th when you said Pong was our virtual reality, really our virtual reality then was movies, right? You go into a dark theater. Yeah and and uh there'd be sound and there'd be sight you these two senses would be you know would be um 
focused. You know, you make everything else dark and you focus, you know, your hearing and your sight on this big screen. And then you get lost in that world. And to some degree, you kind of feel like you're in it. And you, you emotionally, you become very tied to it, very connected. Right, to you it. live vicariously through all the players' emotions yeah. and uh, fears and dangers and explosions. Right. And right. So, so, um, so anyway, let's let's read about this. This talks about how that that uh, sometimes I speak of how like if this world is a virtual reality, then like Vishnu is like the programmer, and he's programming it with the three modes of material nature, with time, with um, with uh, karma, the law of karma. And so, so some of that's going to come out here, and then it's going to get into those Mahabhutas that we were speaking about, those basic material elements and the senses, the sense objects, and then the gods of the senses. So it's, this is text 27. Thereafter, influenced by the interactions of eternal time, that, that oven that's heating everything up, the supreme sum total of matter, the big dough, called the Mahatattva, became manifested. And in this Mahatattva, the unalloyed goodness, the Supreme Lord, sowed the seeds of universal manifestation out of his own body. Thereafter, the Mahatattva differentiated itself into many different forms as the reservoir of the would-be entities. The Mahatattva is chiefly in the mode of ignorance, and it generates the false ego. It is the plenary expansion of the personality of God with full consciousness of creative principles and time for fructification. And this is, I'm, we're, we're going to move real fast to this. Again, like scientists could go deep into this kind of stuff, but I'm just trying to draw out one very essential message is that the material world and the bodies for us are being designed so that we can enter into the virtual reality. Text 29, Mahatattva or the causal truth transforms into false ego, which manifests in the three phases, cause, effect, and the doer. All such activities are on the mental plane and are based on the material elements, gross senses, and mental speculation. The false ego is represented in three different modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. The false ego is transformed into mind by interaction with the mode of goodness. All the demigods who control this phenomenal world are also products of the same principle, namely the interaction of the mode of goodness. The, the senses are certainly products of the mode of passion and false ego, and therefore philosophical speculative knowledge and fruit of activities are predominantly products of the mode of passion. Now, now, now we're going to go through ether, which is going to be called sky here, and then um, air, and then fire, which is going to be called electricity here, and then water, and then earth. And, and so the, the objects of the senses and the, 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 um, the senses themselves how they progress one after another, how they, you know, that dough is rising and you get one after the other, they start to manifest. So he says, the sky is a product of sound. So here sky means the ether. And sound is a transformation of egoistic ignorance. In other words, the sky is the symbolic representation of the supreme soul. I mean, what that means, I'm not so, you know, it's like you, you, devotees with deeper scientific knowledge, and, and you know, of this stuff can explain these verses in much greater detail. Thereafter, the personality God had glanced over the sky, partially mixed with eternal time and eternal energy and external energy, and thus developed the touch sensation from which the air in the sky was produced. So first there's ether with sound, and now there's air with, with the tactile sense. Thereafter, the extremely powerful air interacting with the sky generated the form of sense perception, and the perception of form transformed into electricity, the light to see the world. So that's the element of fire and the sense of sight. Text 35. When electricity was surcharged in the air and was glanced over by the Supreme, at that time, by a mixture of, etern of eternal time and external energy, there occurred the creation of water and taste. Thereafter, the water produced from, elec from electricity was glanced over by the Supreme Personality of God and mixed with eternal time and external energy. Thus, it transformed the into the earth, which is qualified primarily by smell. So you had each one of the sense objects, and each of the senses developed. Now Maitreya says to Vidura, O oh, gentle one, all the physical elements beginning from the sky down to the earth, all the inferior and superior qualities 
are due only to the final touch of the glands of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's the baker, right? Now, now this is text 38, and now we're going to enter into a very interesting area here, because now you have, not only were the, we read about the creation of the objects of the senses and the senses themselves. So the, the suits that we're going to wear in, in the virtual reality, as well as what we're going to, the programming of what we're going to experience, but also the devas are going to be described as the gods, the gods that rule the senses and rule those material elements were also created. And they're all jivas themselves. They're all in their own god suits themselves, but they all have a responsibility to play in making this all work. And all of it is a service to Lord Vishnu or to Krishna. Because as we read in the beginning of this chapter, it's almost like, you know, a husband waking up a wife this material world is designed in such a way to, to wake us up. And so they all have their role to play in this big process. And they see themselves as servants of Lord Vishnu, but they also feel like, I don't know if we've got what it takes to make this work. Right? Like, I, you know, sometimes you're given a big responsibility or you start a new business or whatever, and, and you get that feeling like, I don't know if, I don't know if I got it. Self-doubt, yeah. So, so, the, cool. so as a group, the devas are feeling a sense of self-doubt and they're turning to Lord Vishnu and they begin their prayers. And so uh, text 38 um, begins that process. Let me pull it up here. The controlling deities of all the above mentioned physical elements are empowered expansions of Lord Vishnu. So they're, they're all given special power by Lord Vishnu to carry out their task. They are embodied by the eternal time under the external energy. By the way, that's been repeated in every one, right? Uh, and they are his parts and parcels. But they were entrusted with different func because they were entrusted with different functions of the universe of universal duties and were unable to perform them, they offered fascinating prayers to the Lord as follows. All right. And this to me, just the setting of all of this. I find very interesting because what we're seeing here is that these, these um, individuals, the devas, their tendency is to be devoted, right? Their tendency is to see themselves as devoted servants of Lord Vishnu. And they've got a task to perform as service. They have a, a sense of self-doubt. Can I accomplish this? But what the response was, they all come together, right? They all come together and they place their, their concerns, uh, as well as even their emotions, their feelings of, of connection and surrender to Vishnu. Together they come and they express them. And I think that's important because it, it, this reminds me of, um, I've heard about a commentary, and I believe by Jiva Goswami, um, a great, you know, bhakti philosopher, where it describes how at the beginning of, uh, um, how all the devas on behalf of the earth, when we were, again, when the earth is feeling despondent because of all the horrible leaders, then all the devas on behalf of the earth get together and they go together to pray to Lord Vishnu. And the commentary on that was that when it's one thing if we pray on our own, but when when all the jivas, right, when all the souls, they come together and together they approach God, there's a power in that. And, and, and it's, it's, it's all the more heard, right? And, and the cooperation in itself kind of pleases the Lord. And therefore, this kirtan is really the, the, the most powerful form of yoga. You with me, Raghu? Yeah, it's group prayer. Yeah. I'm doing some bioluminescent yawning right now. Because <laughs> you're up all night. I was up all night too, so not last night. So, um, well, yeah. Late at night with Kostuba? What was that about? No, it just, you know, it just took me a long time to fall asleep. But then I still got up early, so it was like, oh, yeah, I got a few hours of sleep. He's one of those guys. you got to wind down. Kostuba's got to wind down before I am he goes a wind to sleep. Kind of guy. Yeah, 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 you're not. I'm a conk out. <laughs> That's right. You're a wind down. I'm like, I have a 
tiny window where I'm awake. It's sort of like, hey, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that quick. And then I'm out <laughs> for the entire night. <laughs> I've seen it happen. So, um, so, you know, the practice of so group Ka- prayer, group prayer, group prayer. Every, that's where we left off. Yeah, I'm excited today because uh, I'll probably see Bhakti Louie. I'm getting all these texts even right now because, you know, the weather was beautiful in, in New York. This it has been and will continue to be beautiful in New York this week. You got, uh, sorry about that, Robert. I heard. Yes, I heard. <laughs> I was hoping there'd be more distress in your life. <laughs> I know. So, uh, so um, we can go out and do kirtan, in, you know, in the park mm. uh, today. And, um, so, so yeah, but, but the the idea is when you get together and you express yourself together, there's power in that. And, and bhakti, it comprises two approaches, right? There's our own individual internal meditation and prayer, and that's a very important part of our of our spiritual life, right? There's a dynamic there. We each have an individual personal relationship with God. We cultivate that through meditation. We cultivate that through prayer. Uh, but there's also our cooperative efforts. And, you know, in, in, in Sanskrit, we call that sankirtan, right? Kirtan means to glorify, and sankirtan means like holy or together. So Can I ask the, you a question in this yeah. regard? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm playing the devil's advocate. Mm-hmm. It, it seems like prayer should be done privately, where there's no room, re- where there's not so much space for the ego to step in, whereas public kirtan could be... Uh, performance for the ego. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, even Christ says in the Bible, you know, how to, how to pray. And it's like, and even some, and some, even in some Hindu or Vaishnava traditions, the, the worship of the deity is to be done privately. It's not for, it's not for a big um, pomp and ceremony. Um, um, so what would you say about, about that? How, how can you protect yourself from the ego or, or is or are there better ways to do where where you're doing your kirtan privately? Well, I, there's a few things I could say. Um, the first would be in terms of our own individual prayer or or meditation or practice. We're we're unlimitedly capable of of um, deluding ourselves. You know, <laughs> right. we'll bring ego, we'll bring ego anywhere. Yeah, we can bring ego into our own individual prayer for sure. You know, or just be consumed by it. So we're sitting there praying and thinking we're so special and or, or whatever it may be. But um, I would say there's two things about this cooperative effort, you know, or the Sankirtan that that um, make it very powerful. And what are you doing? You playing something? No, it's this lady. It's oh. <laughs> some lady in a car playing Puerto Rican radio. I see. Okay. So, um, but two things that, that kind of make uh, this, this cooperative effort or the Sankirtan effort partic- particularly powerful. One of it is that the dynamic of it demands that we let go of our false ego. It, you, you, could say, sure. you, you could say that it, it could become a, a forum for a false ego and certainly like, you know, leading a Kirtan or whatever it, it could involve that, sure. But to really cooperate you know, to join together with others in an effort to, you could say to pray, but, but really to, to approach God is what it's all about. It, it, it's going to require deeper, deepening our realization, coming to a corrupt, you know, to the point of cooperation means letting go of my false ego, letting go of seeing that everything has to revolve around me, letting go of attachments to my own ideas and how things should necessarily be one way. You know, there's a there's a maturing and a, and a purification that comes through working together um, that I in my own personal life, I found essential for my own individual spiritual development. Right. Like if I if I never would have had to cooperate with devotees to, and, and work together on different projects. Right. Um, I wouldn't have gone through a lot of the internal work, you know, as an individual. If you weren't spiritually connected, you'd get in some conflict in the workplace, and that conflict would just be, um, you just harbor resentment, be it a major or minor resentment, you'd quit the job, you'd harbor resentment against the boss. At very best, you'd say something like, uh, it's all it's all a bigger, greater plan that I can't see, at, at very best. But the Bhagavatam gives you the tools to actually 
really refine that thinking process and really keep that ego in check um, because no one gets a pass if you're in bhakti from getting your ego crushed and you know dissected matter of fact that's what sort of what we're praying for and so when it comes right. along you're like ooh, it's like i'm getting everything i'm praying for we're, we're asking to be more compassionate more thoughtful more broad-minded um more sensitive to others feelings and um and then when that ego gets you know slapped around you're, you're you're left with all these great tools it doesn't mean it's not hard it doesn't mean like the extraction of the tooth isn't painful but it means you're finally getting that tooth pulled mm. you know if if just to, to give like a visual kind of graphic example um just like take like the solar system you know where you have this the central glowing figure of the sun mm. and then it's surrounded by um planets that are that are um in their orbit kind, kind of mm. like you know like um harmoniously you know they're mm. all harm they're not crashing into each other they're all harmoniously right. circling that sun in their place together and then each one of those planets has you know a, a number of moons you know that are going around the planet mm. and everything's flowing you know, in this harmonious, and, and, and even though they're going around, like the moon is going around the planet, together they're going around the sun. And, you know, so in, so they all, the, the, the moon has its relationship to the planet. Together they have their relationship with the sun. And together they have their relationship with all the other planets that are also circumambulating right. the sun. So there's a beauty in that symmetry and a beauty in that uh, coordination. Uh, that's appealing, you know. Um, and if all those planets were just like a big mess, and all the moons, you know, in their orbits were just a big mess, you would just see a big mess, and it wouldn't be nearly as pleasing, you know. It would be right. just, it would just be a mess. Uh, but when it all clicks into place, you could immediately feel a sense of satisfaction, you know, and it's, it's in a sense of um, sense of harmony and peace, artistry, and, and contentment, and artistry and beauty, and yeah, and all of that. So, in a sense, we're all little planets or little moons trying to kind of like organize things so that it's all, if every planet was trying to get the solar system to, to, to orbit it, you know, right. you would have nothing but a mess. And, and that's kind of what the material world is. So this process of coming together to pray, right, in, in harmony, it's going to mean that I let go of trying to make the whole world work around me. And it's working towards that harmonious kind of like, uh, it, it really takes, um, it demands uh, an elevation of consciousness, an elevation of awareness, an you know, an elevation of devotion to enter into that relationship and make it all work. And, mm. and so the process of making that all work kind of is very purifying. And then when the prayers come out the other end, they're, you know, they're more real. But um, nicely, I think nicely put. I, I think you and I both felt, you know, just in a simpler way, that when you sit in a kirtan, and you, you give your heart to God in that kirtan with a group of people, all humming on that, you know, all vibrating together, right? right? All, all on that same, all in the same groove, all you know, all in that same vibe. That it it does become tremendously. Um, uplifting and powerful, and the prayer goes very deep, and in the mind. Rather than being distracted, you know, we sit down to pray, and quickly the mind's distracted, and quickly the mind's going other places, and mm. and um, even as we pray or as we meditate, as we chant, whatever we do, the mind may be in so many places. But the power of the music and the power of the unity is um, draws that keeps that mind focused, and when everyone's mind is focused together. And everyone's circumambulating, you know, that that divine together, then you begin to feel not the material energy, but the spiritual energy. You know, you get you sense that, and you know, so like verses like, what is it? Um, what's that one? Golo uh, Kara Premadana Hari Nama Sankirtana. You know that mm. that that Hari Nama Sankirtan. Right? There's that word Sankirtan, right? That that yeah. yeah this this Hari this unified chanting of the names it, it's a sense from the spiritual world mm. right it's it, it's made of spiritual energy and you begin to on some level experience that and it's 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 you know it's dynamic 
yeah, I think I think it's safe to say I've been to a kirtan. Everyone's got some type of taste of that. Like yeah. a, it's not an ordinary folk song. And sometimes that that experience is super profound. You know, it's like it's very powerful when every, when everybody's when everybody's feeling that when everybody's letting go of ego, then you really right. feel it. And, and right. you know, I was thinking because um, this is the this was the you know first year in a long time where we haven't been to India together. You know, at, at this time of year, and yeah. uh, a few years back was the appearance of you know a couple of weeks back we on the show we celebrated the appearance of Nityananda and yeah. um and that holiday i was celebrating it was after our retreat i think you and your family had gone somewhere else you know uh maybe to goa or someplace like that um briefly i stayed an extra day or two in mumbai and uh one of those days was Nityananda's appearance day Right. And on that day, Radna Swami, he spoke about Nichananda for four hours. <laughs> okay. And um, I think it was like uh, two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, or three hours in the morning, one hour in the evening. Um, but that extended hearing, you know, of such a deeply sacred uh, message coming from such a deeply connected person, the vibrations that were coming through his words, the, you know, the, the spiritual power that was coming through them was so, it absorbed the mind and spiritual energy so deeply amongst the hundreds of people in that temple, right? Crammed yeah. in there, you know, in, in Chaupati, Mumbai, that um, everyone, you know, it's that hearing is through, the, this is why it's really important for Kirtan, you know, through that hearing, everyone, got to a place you know of of uh, spiritual purity at least for the time being you know and and then and then Gorvani led kirtan and maharaj danced you know radha swami danced and then and then everybody danced and it was the kind of thing where every single person was feeling it like on a, a special level <laughs> you know just like in right. those in those moments, you you could just all look at each other and say, "This is just another thing. This is another." Level. Almost like you've recreated the the spiritual world in the material world. Exactly, that's exactly right. Because what is the spiritual world? Everything's revolving around that divine source, that that root of all existence. Everything's harmoniously. You and know, you're perfectly, around. and yeah, you're perfectly linked up in that flow of yeah. um, of who. You, uh, how you're supposed to think, how you're supposed to act, how you're supposed to behave, that gives you the ultimate joy. Yeah. yeah. That's how that's how that's how to describe it. Yeah. So so um, so that cooperative effort, it requires it, it kind of like accelerates the um need to let go of one's ego. Mm. Right. And and to become part of a to to become part of a cooperative effort re requires that. Just in general, what to speak of in spiritual circles. And you know, when you read Bhagavatam. You see this principle playing out again and again, like where even the most materially successful people, the Indra, for instance, you know, when his ego, when when that material, even though he's by nature a very pious person that wants to be devoted to God, that um, the the opulence that comes with his role, the fame that comes with his role, the wealth that comes with his role, the 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 potential for sense enjoyment that comes with his role that will have the tendency if one's not very careful to cover your knowledge cover your understanding and increase your sense of false ego and self-importance and so even a great soul like indra you know he falls into illusion that and then the, and then the devas suffer right they go through fear they go through anxiety you know the the beautiful world that they're living in starts to become dark and and, and they worry and, and so on you know and then it's just a question and then then it's all about how can they get back and you know reconnected maybe that's our take a takeaway today or a little motto today um if the egos if the, if you if your ego is getting threatened you respond by saying thank you mm. right we're, that's what we're here for. We're ego. We're here to get our ego dismantled. 
So if our ego is getting threatened sometime in the course of the day today, we just say, thank you. Cause I really want to fight it. <laughs> I really want to <laughs> fight it and prove my rightness again and again. Um, I, I like that phrase. We're here to get our ego dismantled. That's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Right. You like that? I like that. That's a bumper sticker right that's there. It's a t-shirt or something. Yeah. 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 We're here, here to, to get, get our, our ego, ego dismantled. dismantled. And, yeah, and so then the, the and it's people... what we're praying for. That's a crazy thing. It's what we're actually praying for. Right. What do you think of, we're chanting for? We're not chanting. We're not chanting for happiness, even though happiness is a product of what you're going to get. We're chanting to get the the material coverings cracked, or to crack that macadamia nut, so to speak, um, to you know, the pineapple skin. We're, we're here to crack that to get to that. Ooh, that's a good one. The pineapple skin, which is sort of hard and spiny. <laughs> To get that sweet fruit underneath, so we're here. We're here. It's gonna. It's gonna be a little painful. And so when those painful things happen, all you can say is, "Wow, it's, this stuff. This process really works. It, it's cracking open, and now I got to deal with it. And how I'm going to deal with it?" Yeah, you learned. My, you, even though it's painful, you learned to embrace it, right? Yeah, my old my old way was to hide it, to bury it, to medicate it, to stick my head into the sand, to defend myself, to um. To, to, to go to that other one we said yesterday, uh, who do they think they are? What do they think they know? They don't know anything. How dare they? Yeah. So in any case, now we're like, take that ego. Yeah. Thank you. So, so that was one reason you asked, like, you know, why would um, this cooperative right. prayer be superior or, you know, preferable in, in any Private. way? To, to private and again that, that that individual meditation and prayer is definitely part of the, the bhakti path mm. but it's said that the method for this age in particular the yuga dharma is this cooperative effort sankirtan so one reason is because it you know it will demand our, our the letting go of our ego which facilitates you know deeper absorption and concentration but there's another reason uh that i would throw out there and it's as simple as this it just pleases God, right? When we work together, it's pleasing. And, and that may tie into that whole kind of like solar system analogy I was using too. You know, it's like, it's pleasing when everyone's working. Somehow he finds that pleasing. Just like a, the parent finds it pleasing when the children are, are happily engaged together, right? That's a good analogy. Yeah. But it, it's also that it's sort of like one symptom of, I think it's like of addiction or of depression is like isolation we want to isolate from others mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so you know we're asked to interact at the very least with a therapist or like in the 12-step group you're asked to reach out to a friend or um interpersonalism is we, we've created a world where it's very easy to isolate you know they have this ever ever this thing about how, how kids nowadays they don't have as much illicit sex or d get into the trouble like kids did in our generation because they are isolated. They live online. Their romances are online and their hanging out is online. And so we've created a world where you don't even have to leave your little room. Um, and we, we and um, there needs to be real personal relationships and personal connection again. And I think that's part of the overall healing. So maybe that can tie into why the groupness, the Sankirtan or the group prayer is even most effective for this age because one of these big symptoms of Kali Yuga is this deep isolation. And in that isolation, you can think, yeah, you can get depressed. You can think I'm the only one who's depressed. Everybody else seems like they're having fun. Um, maybe it's just a way to deal with this Kali Yuga mind of ours. I think so. You know, I've heard the analogy used before, and actually, you must have used it before. I'm not sure if we used it on Wisdom of the Sages or if it was back in the um, Super Soul Sacred Sangha days. But uh, when you were a kid, uh, you found some fascination, and maybe still do, uh, <laughs> of those old rock. Uh, what do they call those things? Those at rocks. Rock polisher. Rock polisher, where you oh, like rock a little polishers, yeah, those are great. Little, why don't you describe <laughs> what it is? I thought you meant a pet rock. A rock polisher. You want to explain it, Mara? I never had one. My parents. I never had one. Either. I thought you did. Okay. You were just I always wanted by... one. Okay. That's what it was. Yeah. You put a rock in and it tosses it around. I don't know what it quite does. What it, it, you put a bunch it... of rocks in there and, and it spins them around together. And after it spins them around together, they come out all shiny. Right? Beautiful. 
I don't even know how it works. Well, it's, you know, it's just a friction, you know, shines them. They polish each other. The friction between them polishes them. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. so, That's the you know, analogy. yeah. So learning to work together with with others, you know, it, like you're saying, the tendency is to become quickly offended. All, all of your six, you know, pillars of bhakti come into play. You know, we tend to become easily offended you know, and take things personally, we tend to offend others, you know, and, and mm. but by going through that process, always with the, the example of the sadhus, the example of the, of the advanced bhakti yogis, and the wisdom coming from the, the sacred texts, as you know, guiding us through this difficult friction of working with others, you, mm. you, you start to let go of the ego, you start to, you know, work for the higher purpose together. And, and in this way, even though we're bumping into each other, you know, we are um, that that friction is creating a kind of polishing, you know, a kind of refining of our character that's that's going to make us more receptive to spiritual life rather than less. And so, our tendency is as soon as there's a little friction, we blame the the person. As soon as there's a little friction, we blame the institution. We, you know, there's always some rationale to isolate. Sure. Um, but uh, there's a value in, in sticking through it, and we grow through it. You know. That's it. And with that. We're rock polishing today. This is going to work. We're polishing rocks. What are some other? What dismantling the ego? That's it. Okay. Hey, so uh, we don't have a we don't have the uh, normal show tomorrow because you're traveling tomorrow and Sunday. But yeah, I'll be Sorry doing my that. Bhakti One like One in the, in that slot. So for those that want oh. something to do, yeah, you tune in same. Same time, which would be eight. It's a sleep in Saturday and Sunday, so that'll be 8 a.m. I'll continue, and we finally worked our way up. We've gone through the four paths of yoga, Ashtanga, Jnana, Karma. Now we're going to get into Bhakti Yoga in depth, uh, at Bhakti 101. So if you want to join that, you can. Uh, the secret codes are the same for as for this meeting, but if you don't have those codes, write to Mara at Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com and tune in tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time. And there's a Bhakti Recovery meeting tonight, today, at 3 p.m. So if you're a uh, if you're a um, Patreon member, you can uh, you can sign up. It's a uh, patreoncom slash of the Sages. Our our podcast, our our community supported podcast. That's how you contribute to it to keep this thing going. But we have this beautiful, wonderful 12 step recovery group. Okay, if you're Nope. <laughs> Anything else happening, Mary? Yeah, Jamuna Jaya is teaching a. Now. Check out this view. Wow. Jamuna cool. Jaya is teaching a fun day Friday asana class at 5:30 today. Fun day Friday sounds exciting. She's a fun person, so uh, fun. it should be exciting. <laughs> She's fun. We all love her. All right, everybody, it's time to dance. But now I'm walking on the main drag. If I dance now, it's going to be very awkward. Do it. We, let's see you full on dance without any, um, without, what do you, how do you describe it? Without any, you there, Robin? He froze on us. <laughs>